It's been quite a few years now since I led my first tour to Israel. I took 22 young men from all across North America, and it was a pretty discounted rate tour. I think it was $1,000. We stayed in two-star hotels and basically flat spots to sleep, but it was a great time. And uh, one of the things we did on the tour, there was a group in Jerusalem called Dig for a Day, and they would teach you a little bit about archaeology and the different periods of archaeology and uh, how archaeologists worked and how they dated by pottery types and so on, interesting things to discover. And then we would go actually out to a site and we would work for really about half a day on an actual site. Now in those days uh, you got to go various, uh, very interesting places and we were actually working on the steps to the palace of King Herod just inside the Jaffa Gate. And uh, it was a great opportunity, you know. They would basically dig their way down through 2,000 years of history and they'd say, just throw that over there. We're not really interested <laughs> until we get back to the Second Temple period. And you'd find, you know, Turkish hubbly bubbly pipes and uh, Roman pottery and all sorts of things. Most of the stuff you could keep and take home with you, uh, whatever you found. Well, I told these young men, listen, these fellows, they could care less about your Christianity. Most of them were atheistic Jews. I think the leader at that time, don't quote me here, but I think his name was Bernie Alpert. And uh, I said, but they do understand sweat. Uh, they, they understand the value of sweat equity, of good hard work. So it's going to be hot, but you get out there and work like nobody else has worked and see if we can gain their appreciation by our hard effort. Well, I tell you, those fellas moved a mountain. They were in shape. I actually was in those days. And we worked hard, never asked for a bottle of water, never slowed down. We just kept plowing away. Well, at the end of the time, he sort of called us to attention and he told us, he said, you have been the hardest working people we have ever had on Dig for a Day. And he said, if we had fellows like you all the time, we'd clear Jerusalem in no time. In fact, he said, you know, we have a term for people like you. We call you righteous Gentiles. Well, I had the opportunity to answer him and, and to thank him for the kindness, for the opportunity. And I said, you know, we're just a bunch of Gentiles that you would allow us to come over here and dig around in your country and help explore with you these amazing historical sites. It just is pretty thrilling and we are deeply grateful. And I had heard Dr. Ruth Schwartfeger talk a little bit about this very point, this idea of righteous Gentiles, and I was able to respond to this man on that very point. And I said to him, you know, you mentioned that we are righteous Gentiles, and I said, I, I wonder, could you tell us what is the basis of those Gentiles' righteousness? Well, he didn't quite know what to say. I don't think he was a very religious Jew. And I said, but as far as the Jewish nation is concerned, there is only one standard of righteousness, isn't there? It's the righteousness of God. So how could we, Gentiles, have the righteousness of God? And then I quoted to him the words of Romans chapter 3, found in verses 21 and 22, which say that there is a righteousness, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, it's not inconsistent with the Old Testament scriptures. The same principle of grace, for we read that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's consistent with the Old Testament message. And then Paul tells us what it is. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all 
those who believe. And so I said, we appreciate you giving us this honor, calling us righteous Gentiles. It's the righteousness of God we've received by faith, by just taking God at his word. And I said, we'd like to do something for you gentlemen. Uh, they were pretty hard bitten uh, characters, these. But all our young men gathered together and it was perfect acoustics because we were actually down in a trench, as I say, just inside the Jaffa Gate. And we sang for them in four part harmony. We've been practicing the 23rd Psalm to Crimond. And I said, you know, this isn't our Psalm. This was written by a Jewish king to the Jewish people, but we now embrace the truth of it and we have discovered that the Lord is our shepherd and he's the one who's going to get us home safely. And he has provided through his death at Calvary this righteousness which we could not attain ourselves. It's righteousness through faith by simply believing what God has said. It was a tremendous experience that day. Dig for a day. You can still do it. The archaeological seminars in Jerusalem uh, you don't get to go to uh, Herod's palace. You go to some caves outside of Jerusalem somewhere. But it was a tremendous experience. And it just reminds us, oh, the bliss of it, oh, the wonder of it, that we who were not a people, sinners of the Gentiles, are now the people of God, not by any merit, but by grace through faith, believing God, we have become the spiritual children of Abraham receiving the same righteousness, the righteousness of God, by simple faith in what God has said.